Okay. So the recording's going to look a little bit different, uh, and it's going to sound a little bit different, but it's, it's okay. It's okay. We'll make it work. So chapter eight is uh, introduction to genomics. Um, the first half of chapter eight is about sequencing in the human genome project. And then the second half of chapter eight that we'll cover on Wednesday is all about the variations among humans. Okay. We're getting to a point now where we have several tens of thousands of human genomes that at least are partially complete. And so we have a good deal of an idea of how uh, certain features vary among humans. All right. Key terms. Uh, genomes. Uh, there, there, there's really, there, there, there are several ways that you can define a genome, but there's really only one that's really helpful, and that it is, it, it is the entire set of geno genetic programming. It is an individual's entire set of genetic programming. That is, it includes all of the nuclear DNA and all of the mitochondrial DNA, as well as all of the RNAs that are uh, that are active at, at, at any at any given time. Okay, so it's all of the genetic programming, and so in in a sense, a genome would also include the epigenome in a most general sense because that is part of the genetic programming, how epigenetics have transformed it. And so in this class, when 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 we refer to the term genome, I want you to think holistically. And then if we're going to talk about a more specific portion of it, I will, I will make it clear that we are talking about maybe just the nuclear genome or just uh, what we would call the transcriptome, okay, which is just the RNA portion, you know, what, what we have is uh, our RNA uh, products or just the epigenome, okay? But when you hear genome, think very holistic, think we're talking about everything to do with the genetic programming. Now, genomics, genomics like genome, uh, multiple ways in which you can define this. Uh, we're just going to simply say that genomics is the, the, the study of the factors related to the programming and the consequences of that programming. Okay. So again, when, when, when we use the term genomics, we're going to talk about the factors related uh, to the programming. That is, you know, methylation patterns. Um, work of various types of RNA, uh, inheritance, all of these different factors involved in influencing an organism's genome and then also the consequences of that genome. What does that mean as far as the phenotype is concerned? What does that mean as far as how this organism is related to other individuals of the same species or individuals of a different species? And what does it mean as far as it, its ability to pass on certain genetic features. Okay? All right. Wait, what was the gift that gave birth to methylation patterns and what Oh, so methylation patterns, the work of various uh, RNAs in, in regulating gene expression and inheritance. All right. So the Human Genome Project. Uh, was started as a joint project of two uh, federal organizations. One of them was the Department of Energy, and the other one, I think, was the National Institute of Health, the NIH. That sounds right. I know the Department of Energy is one, and I think it's NIH, the, the National Institute of Health. And um, it, it started in 1990, uh, and it was intended to be um, basically a 15-year-long project in which the goal was to sequence the genomes of a handful of individuals, okay, with a with a a, a variety of different ethnic backgrounds. And the, the Department of Energy is is kind of a, an interesting played an interesting role. Uh, the Department of Ener Energy actually funded most of the project. The, the initial funding for the project was three billion dollars. And most of that funding came from the Department of Energy because they had been tasked by Congress to figure out what are the implications of high levels of radiation on, on, on humans. Okay? And so the Department of Energy had been tasked by Congress to figure this out. And so they had money to, uh, to spend on, on these types of research. And they decided that the absolute best way we could determine this is to go right to the code. We know that there's a relationship between 
uh, exposure to radiation and mutations in the code. So let's go right to the code. We, we need to understand and, and we need to have a good idea of, of what the sequence is um, before we can start to really understand how different factors influence uh, the human genome. So it started in 1990. Um, the, the 90s were very, very, very slow, very slow. Um, and we'll talk, we'll talk more about this. And it was, it was really a philosophy issue on, on how the sequencing should be done. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about how it got spiced up a little bit, how it got spiced up a little bit. But anyways, the Human Genome Project ultimately came to a conclusion in 2002, I believe, three years ahead of schedule. But the, the, the original genomes were published in 1999, three years before that even. And so it, it beat its, its goal. Uh, I don't know exactly what that meant as far as funding, whether it came in over or under budget. My suspicion is it came in over budget like most things do. But it did come, it did finish ahead of schedule. Okay. All right, so there's the Human Genome Project. Um, a few different methods of sequencing that we're going to talk about. Singer sequencing. And so the, the biggest reason why the first, you know, five years especially and even into year six, seven and eight were fairly slow on the Human Genome Project is because they were, they were married to Sanger sequencing, okay? And, 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 and I'll show you what that is. It is a painstakingly slow way to sequence genetic material. It is more accurate um, and requires less interpretation on the back end than other forms of sequencing, but it's really, really slow. And, and I'll, I'll show you why in just a moment. Why is it called Sanger? Because it's named after, uh, I think, is, is it Roger Sanger? His last name is Sanger. I, anyways, I, I won't remember what his last name is, but what if you can look him up and maybe it is Roger. I don't know. Um, anyways, uh, there was one of the, one of the people in charge of the human genome project. His name was Craig Venter. Uh, I think it's spelled V E N T O R. Um, he argued that Sanger sequencing was never going to accomplish the goal of, of, of sequencing the human genome. And so he advocated for using what's called shotgun sequencing. Frederick, Frederick Sanger. That's not, that's not Roger at all. They don't even start with the same letter. Anyways, um, but he advocated for using shotgun sequencing, which was uh, basically you, you take the genome, you cut it into a bunch of bite-sized pieces, you sequence those, and then you realign all of your pieces. Okay, and again, I'll, I'll show you how this sequencing <laughs> method works. Um, he, he said that we're never going to finish this project unless we use a different method, but this method had at that point never been applied to anything other than bacterial genomes that are small, okay, that are nowhere near the three billion bases in the human genome. And so Craig Venter actually left the human genome project and started a, his own company and got funding and actually published at the same time the Human Genome Project did the initial human genome. Within a few days of each other, they both published the, the first human genome, the Human Genome Project and then Craig Venter's uh, company. One published in Nature, one published in, in Science. And Venter's company, the first genome that they published was Craig Venter's own genome. <laughs> so it's kind of fun. All right, neither one of these sequencing methods are really used much today. We've got uh, a whole suite of different strategies that all collectively referred to as next generation sequencing. Um, and and what, this is, what this is aimed to do is really cut down the cost of doing this. So the Human Genome Project was given a budget of $3 billion. And again, I don't know if they came in over budget or if they came in right at budget, but but let's just say it cost them $3 billion to sequence the, the first human genome. Craig Venter's company, I think, sequenced their genome for about $150 million. So significantly less than $3 billion. Uh, but next generation sequencing has dropped the cost to a little bit over $1,000. You could sequence 
a, a human <laughs> genome for a little bit over a thousand dollars. There are companies I think that'll do it for fifteen hundred. You could do it yourself for maybe somewhere around a thousand dollars if you had the machinery necessary uh, to do it. That's a lot less than three billion. Okay, you're talking about a what is that? A magnitude, a, a one million times drop in the cost of sequencing in 20 years, a little bit less than 20 years. Okay, so we'll talk about next generation sequencing. I mean, just kind of a broad umbrella because again, there are several different strategies in there. A few more key terms. We have what are called paralogous or paralogous genes. I, I prefer paralogous, but I, don't, I think I might be the only person that pronounces it that way, but I think it sounds better than paralogous uh, genes. Uh, these are genes that are basically exist in what we call gene families. That you've got multiple genes that are so similar that they produce very similar protein products. Uh, and the idea is, from an evolutionary perspective, that they originated as a single gene that has, over time, developed into multiple genes. Okay, Paralogous or paralogous genes. But again, these are like entire gene families. Um, so like hemoglobin, where you've got hemoglobin, the alpha hemoglobin and beta hemoglobin. These are an example of uh, paralogous genes, okay? Where their protein products are very similar. Um, their overall sequences are, are very similar. And the idea is if you don't have a programmer that it seems to make sense that it started as an original gene that has uh, in the past duplicated. Orthologous genes. Orthologous genes are genes that the sequence has changed enough that the protein product is, is different enough that it's, it's triggered or it's, it's a candidate for fueling a speciation event. So if, if you want to do, think through what, what, is, what is oftentimes used as some of the best examples of orthologous genes would be to take the same protein found in a chimpanzee as what you find in a human, and then you, you go and you find the genes for that protein product, and you would say that these are orthologous genes. If humans and chimpanzees actually did at one point share a common ancestor, then what would have had to fuel those speciation events are mutations in genes that lead to slightly different protein products and ultimately can help to develop reproductive isolation. Yeah, Kaylee. Um, for the paragulous genes, are those genes within the same... Yes, in the same organism. Yep, okay. within the same genome. Yep. Now, oftentimes they're on different chromosomes, okay. right? So it's not like the two, you know, like your two versions of chromosome one, those wouldn't be paralogous genes. It would be like you've got, say, maybe a gene on chromosome 1. You have a separate gene on chromosome 14 that the sequences are very similar. They're, they're, they're being transcribed into very similar RNAs and being translated into very similar proteins. So in the same? In the same genome, yes. Whereas orthologous genes are going to be in separate genomes, in separate species. And again, they're going to be the candidates for driving speciation events. Yeah, John. <laughs> but they're starting with the assumption that humans and chimpanzees Oh, of course. Right. So then they just, they start with that assumption and then they work backwards. Right. So if you assume that they're related and that you should find evidence of that relationship, then the only explanation for the differences is that it's been a result of mutations and at one point they were the same gene and the same organism. Right. But if you're starting with the assumption that there are discrete. So looking at the genes and then work, then come the conclusion that humans. No, very rarely. Usually it starts at the level of like assuming ancestry and then looking for evidence for it. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's Yeah, I mean it's 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 a commitment to methodological naturalism, right? So if there are only natural explanations for all natural phenomena, then it's what's required. Right? This works for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, every, every system of knowing operates on assumptions, right? Yeah. Every what you call epistemological system has a set of assumptions that are not tested, right? And so methodological naturalism, one of those assumptions is that there are natural causes for all natural phenomena, right? And so it's not, it's not, it's not tested. It's an assumption. It's, it's an inherent part of the system, the worldview. Yeah. 
And that's what you're forced to operate under. You can't have any divine. Right. You can't have anything supernatural. Everything has to have a natural explanation and a natural cause. There are no supernatural causes for any natural uh, effects. All right. Last key term, pseudogenes. Um, so pseudogenes, the difference between a pseudogene and a parologous gene is a pseudogene is, is, is not, it's not fully functional. It's, it, 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 it cannot be transcribed and then translated. It doesn't result in any protein product. However, it still has a sequence similar to another gene and it might be transcribed, but it will not be translated. And so the idea with these pseudogenes is, and we'll talk more about pseudogenes at the end of our time together, but the idea with the pseudogenes is that they are the result of a copy and paste translocation. Okay? Where you had basically uh, a section of the genome get duplicated and reinserted somewhere else. And you're like, that seems kind of cool, but a little weird. What's, what's the point of that? Uh, and we're starting to find that uh, pseudogenes, while it, 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 it makes sense because if your definition of a gene is a section of the DNA that is ultimately going to be translated into protein, these are certainly not that. They don't get translated into protein, but they do get transcribed. So if your definition of a gene is any part of the DNA that gets transcribed into RNA, then these are certainly not pseudogenes because oftentimes these are still being transcribed. They are regulatory elements often. Okay, but again, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Okay, any questions about these key terms? I know they're good. These are good ones. You're like, I've been waiting, Dr. Engel, this entire semester for genomics, and now that it's here, I don't know what to do with myself. Mia. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong, but I thought like in cell biology said like that like most genes don't end up being like translated anyway, or like a big amount of them. Well, most of the genome is not does not code for protein. Right. Right. But when in this class we had uh, the term gene, it came up maybe two weeks ago, maybe last week, and we defined it as any part of the genome that gets transcribed, and that accounts for almost ninety percent of the genome gets transcribed. About 2% of it will ultimately get translated into protein, but close to 90% of it will be transcribed at some point. Okay, different sequencing strategies. So here is Sanger sequencing. And this is really colorful and it, it's quite beautiful, but again, it's, it's painstakingly slow. So here's how Sanger sequencing works. Notice we've got this, you see this, DDTTP, DDATP, DDGDP, GTP, not DP, and DDCTP. Okay, ignore the DD for a minute, and you're like, ATP, I know what that is, right? That's an RNA nucleotide. Now then if we ignore just the beginning D, you're like, I know what that is too. That's a DNA nucleotide with adenine as the base. So DATP, you can't call it ATP because that's a RNA nucleotide. So we call it DATP, okay? And you're like, that's a DNA nucleotide. These are the building blocks. These are the monomers to build DNA, right? Mm -hmm. when, when DNA is being duplicated, these are your raw materials. These are your monomers using to build it, okay? And then you're like, what is that extra D there? Because like ATP, I know what that is. DATP, I maybe haven't seen that before, but that makes sense, right? It's not ATP because that's a ribonucleotide. That's a deoxyribonucleotide. But what's the D, D, A, T, P? And so that D stands for di, di deoxy DNA nucleotide, or di deoxy nucleotide, because, yeah. yeah, di deoxy nucleotide, okay? And you're like, okay, I know what that root di means. It means two. And so what this is saying then, if it's di-deoxy, we've removed the oxygen from multiple carbons on that sugar. Okay? Make sense? So typically, the difference between ribose and deoxyribose is that you're missing an oxygen on carbon number two. Okay? And that's why we call it deoxyribose. It's missing an oxygen, and it's missing it on carbon number two. For these, 
we have a, an additional oxygen removed from carbon number three. And what is the significance of carbon number three on a nucleotide? That's five to three prime. There's something very significant about carbon three. It's part of how we orient strands of DNA. And you're like, interesting. And so if we make note of that three prime, that free carbon three on the end, it's only free because there's not another nucleotide attached to it. That's one of the carbons associated with the phosphodiester bond, right? That strings nucleotides together. Yep, the specific covalent bonds that attach one nucleotide to another is a phosphodiester bond. Where you've got the phosphate group connected to carbon five on one nucleotide and carbon three on the previous one, right? Is it all coming back? It's like riding a bike. Except for this one's not muscle memory, this one's habit. I guess ha muscle memory is kind of habit too. Anyways, same neurological function, different, you know, physiological response. Anyways, so what we've done is, is we carry out these sequencing reactions in different vessels. And so this has all of the normal deoxynucleotides, but it also has uh, di-deoxy um, nucleotides with thymine as the base, okay? And whenever you attach this, the di-deoxy, you, you cannot continue the DNA polymerization because there's no oxygen there to facilitate a phosphodiester bond. So it, in essence, it poisons the process. That's the language we use, okay? And in this one, we have all of the normal deoxynucleotides, but we also have these di-deoxy uh, nucleotides with adenine as a base. And then in this reaction, we've got all of the normal nucleotides, but we also have the di-deoxy nucleotides with guanine as the base, and here with cytosine. Okay, so in these reactions, we have all of the normal nucleotides you need to carry out DNA replication. But we also have these that are going to poison the process. Okay, and so what you do is you carry out DNA replication in these four different types of environments, okay, and... It's, it's, it's random which nucleotide's going to get attached, okay? And so sometimes you're gonna attach the normal thymine base, but sometimes you're gonna attach the poisoned thymine base that's gonna stop the process, okay? And then in here, again, it's random which nucleotide gets added, and so most, most of the time you're gonna attach the normal adenine, but sometimes you're gonna attach the dideoxy adenine, and it's gonna poison the process and stop the replication. And so after you carry out your, your, your uh, polymerization in all four of these different reactions, then you go and you run these out on gels. And so the longer it was able to go, the longer your, your DNA product is going to be, and the, 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 the shorter it'll run on the gel. Okay, it's actually the other way around. The bigger it is, the faster it runs because it doesn't get caught in all the little pockets of, of the gel. But anyways, so then what you can do is, I guess with this type of gel, the smaller it is, the faster it runs. Um, and so what you can do is, is you can run this out on a really long sequencing gel that will actually allow you to find the product that was only one base long. And then right above that would be the product that's two bases long. And right above that is the product that's three bases long and four bases all the way until you've sequenced the entire chromosome one, which is several hundred million bases long. And you're like, this is going to take a really, really long time, right? If you're using Singer sequencing to sequence a stretch of DNA that's a thousand bases long, you're like, all right, that's, I mean, I basically have to generate fragments that are everywhere from one base long all the way up to a thousand and then run them out on a gel, separate them and figure out what's on the lap, the end of your product in each of these length segments. But it's like, okay, if it's a thousand bases long, that's not that big of a deal. But if it's hundreds of millions of bases long, that is a really complicated process. It's very slow. Now it's very easy to interpret it because you basically just, you, you, you run these sequencing gels and you have a computer analyze them. And the computers, it's very simple for the computer to say, okay, this is 1,345,323 bases long, and the last base is this number. It's very easy for the computer to analyze that. 
but it takes an enormous amount of time to actually carry out the sequencing. Yeah, Alyssa. Wait, so the way you know where it is is how long it is? Yes. But because once you attach one of these, these, these poisoning nucleotides, it won't grow anymore. And then you just look at, okay, well, when, when we had this product that was seven bases long, because when you actually run your gel, you, you, you take this solution, this solution, this solution, and this solution. Okay? You run all four of your solutions on the same sequencing gel. And so you find one that's seven nucleotides long, that would be this one here, and then you look at that last position. And the nice thing is, is you can fluorescently label these poison nucleotides. You didn't even have to actually work very hard because this one that's seven bases long, it's, it's going to be colored based on this poisoned nucleotide. So it's going to fluoresce pink if we use pink for the poisoned thymine nucleotide. Okay? But how does it know that it all starts at the same spot? Uh, because you're, 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 you're controlling where your replication starts. Replication always starts at the same place, right? Replication always starts at the same place. There are what we call origins of replication, but we control that. We, we don't want to just leave it up to that. We actually control it because we put a primer in that will only attach at a very specific part. DNA, uh, DNA polymerase, you have, to, you have to remember, is not self primer It cannot attach the first nucleotide, right? Meaning you need something that can write an RNA primer to, to do that, or you provide the RNA primer. And so if you provide the RNA primer just upstream of where you want to start sequencing, then you're controlling everywhere where the polymerization starts, and it'll always start in the same place, because it starts exactly where you wanted it to. So we know what the nucleotide is based off the color? Yes. The personally labeled thing, and then we yep. know how long it is based off the gel? Based, based on how far it ran through the gel. Yep. But you need really long sequencing gels so you can sequence basically a thousand different length nucleotides at the same time. And it takes forever to run these gels, right? Mm -hmm. You've ran a gel before, and you're like, man, this thing took an hour. It's so inconvenient, right? How many base pairs would you do with the gel when they were doing Like separate these? I mean, you could do thousands at a time, but it's going to take you days to run those gels. But now they don't, they don't run the gels like you would run a gel. They run it through like a, a machine that will. I was just thinking about in the early 90s when they were doing this. this <laughs> that's the process. Yes. And it was slow. And that's why they needed billions of dollars because of the gel. Yeah, they needed billions of dollars because they had to buy a lot of equipment. They had to maintain the equipment. They had to pay an enormous amount of people. And they needed computer processing time. Yeah. Yeah. What do they do? When, what did they do when there's like an error? Like, you know, sometimes an A goes where T's supposed to go and G goes where T's supposed to go. What do they do with that? It, like it, it reads as an error. And so it's an error in sequencing. The Sanger sequencing has an error rate of about one in a million bases, I think. Maybe it's one in a hundred thousand. It's one in a hundred thousand. That's, so that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot worse. Well, it's ten times worse than one in a million, but it's it's got an error rate of about one in a hundred thousand, and the error rate's about consistent with what DNA polymerase's error rate is, because that's what you're using to do these reactions is DNA polymerase. And then you don't have the repair mechanisms that can come in and 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 explore and fix the errors, but so you're subject to the error rate of DNA polymerase. Yeah, does this make sense? So it's in your sequencing, really slow. And so they're five years into this project, and Craig Venture's like, we're never going to finish this. We need to do a different sequencing strategy. And so he's like, we need to use what, what works really well in bacteria, and that's you take a really large DNA molecule, large relative, right, in bacteria, it's not that large, and you cut it into fragments, you sequence the entire fragment, and then, because you've taken multiple copies of the same DNA molecule and you broke it up into different fragments, your fragments are, they're a little bit different, right? If you only took one DNA molecule, shotgun sequencing doesn't work. Because if you take one DNA molecule and you break it into fragments, there's no way to overlap, right? Because you took something that was 100 million bases, you broke it up into 10 million fragments, there's not gonna be any overlap. But if you take a million copies of the same DNA molecule and you cut all of them up into individual fragments, you sequence all of those fragments, you're gonna find places where they overlap. Okay? And so you take these sequences, you plug them into a computer, and you tell the computer to find the areas of overlap. Okay? 
And so this one from this reaction sequence this portion of it, this portion of the fragment, and then a different start DNA molecule was able to generate this fragment, and we look for pieces of overlap, and when we find those pieces of overlap, we tell the computer to basically ignore the, the duplicate, only say one, and then attach all of these fragments together. And so it's much, much faster. You don't have to worry about running them out on gels. You just basically, you, you sequence this, and you can use different strategies that aren't looking at how long the fragments are. That's basically, you just fluorescently label everything. You're like, I'm going to fluorescently label all of my adenine nucleotides, all of my guanine nucleotides, all of my cytosine nucleotides, all of my thymine nucleotides. And every time a nucleotide gets added and you hydrolyze the phosphate groups off of it, it's, it sends a, a, a signal to the computer and the computer reads it. Okay? Every time you add a nucleotide, you're just like, okay, I added, a, I added a guanine here because the guanine color popped up and the computer recognized it. And then afterwards, it takes an enormous amount of analysis on the back end because you have to check all of these areas of overlap that the computers recognize. And if you're like, okay, they only overlap four bases, am I really confident that that's a true area of overlap? What's the probability that two pieces of DNA shared the same four nucleotides? Be, it'd be one in four to the fourth power, which is one in 132, maybe. And you're like, okay, that's not that great of odds, but I've got three billion bases. So that could happen a lot of times in the genome, right? So you, you want to really look for areas of big overlap, where you've got 10, 20, 50, 100 bases overlapped. And now you're like, okay, we're pretty confident that these do actually fit together. This works way quicker, way less expensive, required less computing time. Yeah? So how, I missed the part how it's actually sequenced, though. How it's sequenced? Yeah. I mean, you still, you, see, you sequence it in the same way. You're, you're, you're replicating, the, you're allowing DNA replication to take place. But with this, what you do is you fluorescently label every nucleotide, not just your poisoned nucleotides. And so your guanine nucleotides are labeled in such a way that when you remove the, the two phosphate groups from that guanine nucleotide, it fluoresces a particular color. And you label the cytosine, so when you remove those two excess phosphate groups and put cytosine in the place, it fluoresces a different color. <coughs> and it would, be, it would just like, for, like a macro level. Except for you, want, you, you run one fragment in each reaction. So you take, the, you take your millions of copies of chromosome 1 and you chop them all up into different size fragments, right? And then you separate those fragments and individually sequence those fragments. Okay, so now you've got this fragment. Let's say we took, you know, a, a section of chromosome 1 that was several million bases and we chop it up into different fragments and we get this. Wait, so the computer can tell what's been fluorescent labeled? Yes, in which order. Oh, yep. okay. And so let's say we've got just this fragment here. Okay, so we've got this fragment. That's the only one running in the reaction. Mm -hmm. And we use a very general, I mean, this fragment's way too short. It'd be really hard to sequence this. But anyways, assuming it's longer. And you use a very general primer that will basically allow this process to start anywhere. Yeah, I mean, maybe use another machine that can actually write a primer and is self-priming. And so you sequence this, and what the computer will recognize is the order of every nucleotide added. So when you go to sequence this, basically you would split these into two. So you split these into two, and you're allowing DNA replication to take place. Okay? So you provide a machine that will come in and write the primer, and the order of nucleotides written, the computer will recognize that. Because every time you add a primer, a particular color fluoresces. If you add an A, this color fluoresces. If you add a C, this color fluoresces. And the computer will recognize every single nucleotide added. And so you'll sequence all of those individual fragments, and then you'll plug in all of those sequences into a computer that will look for alignment, look for areas of overlap. And so what it does is it's basically the shorter the fragment is, two things are true. One is the shorter the fragment is, the faster it is to, uh, to copy it for, for DNA replication, and the less likely you are to have errors. Okay? And so maximum fragment length for most of our uh, sequencing techniques are about 1,000 bases. 
Okay, that's that's about as long as you you want to use for most of these to keep your um, fidelity really high to make very few errors and to be able to do it very quickly. So we got to sequence all of these fragments, and the difficulty is is you, you're 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 still doing a lot of sequencing reactions, but you are with Sanger as well. The difference is. You've got smaller pieces that are very, very fast, and you can run several at the same time. Right? So you can run, we've got sequencing machines now where you can run 494 reactions simultaneously. Okay? And, then, and, and it'll run in an hour, maybe even less. Okay? And then you just put in another plate, and you just run all of these fragments, and then you take all of those sequences, you put them in a computer, and the computer will look for areas of overlap. And we'll string this back together. Okay, so next generation sequencing. Next generation sequencing works like next or works like shotgun sequencing sometimes. So you can either take your, your chromosomes and you can chop it up into different fragments, or you can use PCR with different primers and, and replicate all these different pieces on the same chromosome just thousands of times for a particular chromosome. But either way, so we have different strategies of next generation sequencing. Ultimately, you take a really big piece of DNA like chromosome one, several hundred million bases, and you, 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 you break it down into a whole bunch of thousand base pair long pieces, okay? And so you need, if it's a hundred million bases and you're getting a thousand base pieces, it's gonna take you, what, what is that? What is that, a hundred thousand of them? If it's 100 million bases long and you're cutting it into 1,000 at a time. So it's a lot of them. Um, so you've got to run a lot of these reactions, which is why it's still fairly expensive. But then what we do is rather than labeling all of our, um, labeling all of our nucleotides and watching the order in which they're put in, because that only allows you to sequence one fragment at a time, Right, because if you're sequencing two fragments at a time, then the first nucleotide added here is probably not going to match the first nucleotide added on your other fragment, right? And so the computer's like reading, wait, two nucleotides got added at the same time. It's not possible, right? Make sense? So in shotgun sequencing, you only sequence one fragment at a time. But in these next generation uh, methods, what we do is we design little pieces that will go in and will basically uh, grab hold of all of these different fragments and then it'll allow the, the it'll allow you to sequence multiple at a time because you're not really looking at the order until after these have all been duplicated and then you go in and you read you read the sequence okay after they've been duplicated I don't know you leave me alone <laughs> Okay, so we go in, we grab all of these, we can run several fragments at the same time because we're not watching them as the new nucleotides are being added. We'll, we'll polymerize them, we'll write those new nucleotides, and then we'll go in afterwards and we'll analyze them. Okay, we'll have the computer go in and, and read them after the fact. Wait, so if it's not reading it, what's it doing? When it's just replicating, getting millions and millions of copies of every fragment. Oh, so it's replicating. Yes, replicating them. So that every fragment you started with, you now have millions of copies of, or tens of millions of copies of. Yeah. I didn't quite catch what the adapters are doing. The adapters are just grabbing hold of them and attaching them to, keeping them separate from each other so that they don't re anneal and attaching them to other machines okay. to allow replication to take place and then you to keep track of what's. And there are different ways of carrying out next generation sequencing. So. You may attach them to different things, or you may use different types of adapters, but ultimately it all is, is heavily influenced by shotgun sequencing. You take a really pe big piece of DNA, you cut it down into bite-sized pieces, okay? And, and shotgun sequencing, you're basically, you're watching the process of replication to see what order they come in. With a lot of our next generation sequencing strategies, we're, we're just, we're making millions of copies of it, and then we'll go and analyze them later. Okay, so all of this uh, to say that Craig Venter was right, Sanger sequencing was really slow, and when he left the company and got funding, it really forced the Human Genome Project to do things a little bit differently. They still committed to Sanger sequencing, but they made some changes to make it a little bit faster. 
and then uh, next generation sequencing strategies. There are a ton of different types, dozens of different types of next generation sequencing. Uh, but all of them are basically functioning to cut down the cost, cut down the cost of getting a human genome. Now, that being said, all three of our sequencing strategies, all uh, three of our sequencing strategies, um, and, and the human or next generation sequencing, there are dozens, but all three of these categories, they are error prone, right? There are mistakes made in the sequencing, and they leave sections of the human genome unsequenced. And so I, I, I don't know exactly what the percentage is now, um, but the last I checked, and, and I couldn't find a, a present number now, but as of like 2012, 2013, there was still three and a half percent or so of the human genome that has yet to be sequenced. That it's, it's gaps. So we've got like all the way from the beginning to the end, but in the middle there are little pieces missing that ultimately add up to about three and a half percent of the total genome that still has yet to be sequenced. And I, I pulled a paper this morning, I didn't get a chance to read through it on the strategies that scientists are using to close those gaps. Uh, to close those gaps, but there are still gaps in the genome, okay? There are still gaps in the genome. All right. Any questions about our sequencing strategies? We're not going to get quite as far as I, I thought we would, but that's okay. We've got Wednesday. <laughs> Okay. All right. So just quickly, uh, we'll go through some findings of the Human Genome Project. Some of these are surprising. Uh, there are about 21,000 genes. So they, uh, they, they, they had a bet where scientists could pay, I think ultimately got up to $20 and submit their number of what they thought the number of genes would be in the human genome. And then the person that was the closest got all of the money. <laughs> and so the person who won submitted a bet of 24,800. But the average bet was somewhere around 61,000. And then it's, it's slightly over 21,000 genes. This is, this is only genetic coding, right? Yes. Yep, protein coding genes. How much did they get? I don't know. Whatever. I think it was only like 200 people. So 200 times 20 is, was that 4,000? So the gene for dystrophin, which is a, connective, a protein that functions in connective tissue, is the longest gene, 2.2 million bases. Oh, and, and actual length? It would depend on whether the chromosome is condensed or not. But so 3 billion bases is 6 feet long if it is uncondensed. So this would be one, a little bit less than 1 1,000th one of that, so it would be 1 1,000th one of 6 feet. I don't know. Uh, the longest coding region is in the gene TTN. And so the RNA transcript is 104,000 bases long. Chromosomes 17, 19, and 22 are gene rich. I think uh, chromosome 17, oh man, I forget what the number of bases what the number of bases are per, per million, or the number of genes per million bases. I think it's somewhere around, there are 25 or so genes for every million bases on chromosome 17. Chromosomes Y, 4, 13, 18, and X are the poorest chromosomes gene-wise, and these are protein coding genes. Chromosome Y, I think, has about 70 total genes for just over one gene for every one million bases on the chromosome. Wait, so why has 70? 70, about 70 genes total. So in, that includes the genes in PAR1, in PAR2, all of the genes associated with SRY, all of the genes associated with the AZY region. How do they know what's protein coding what's not? Um, because you can match your, the primary sequence of the protein to the RNA that would have been translated into that and then that RNA to a specific section of the DNA. Okay. Does that make sense? 
Okay. So DNA, in order to code for proteins, would have to be transcribed into mRNA, right? And the mRNA is going to match the DNA, okay? Or, but it's going to be an RNA version of it. And then that RNA would be, need to be translated in a very specific way to generate the primary sequence of the protein. So you could work backwards from the protein to find the section in the DNA. How do um, that's an excellent question. Um, you study cells at different points in development and isolate all the proteins from it. So, there are more than 20,000 proteins, and that's because some genes can be alternatively spliced and generate different proteins. All right, so every newborn inherits about 60 new mutations from its parents. Some of these in protein coding genes, some of them not. There are about 70,000 promoter regions, which you'll notice is more than the number of protein coding genes that there are. And that's because even non-protein coding genes have promoters, many of them. About 400,000 enhancer regions. And we are out of time. It's 11.35. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, there's one more, but I don't have time. I'm sorry.